So let's start with one of those demands from the protesters that Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, resign. Even if she did so, though, uh, it would just be a clone of Lam, another Beijing-installed, rubber-stamped, approved leader. Would anything really change? I don't think anything would change as a consequence of her resignation, except, of course, her successor would know how that person's predecessor lost her job uh, and would be more careful about imposing those kinds of reforms. But I do think China needs to be more concerned at this point, needs to be less concerned at this point with exporting its type of civil restriction to Hong Kong. And I think China needs to be more concerned at this point with Hong Kong exporting its type of civil protest to China. Yeah, well, and the protests uh, perhaps didn't get the same coverage in China uh, that they did in the rest of the world. But in terms of that extradition bill, it still hasn't been withdrawn. Was that a bit of a trial balloon from China to uh, tighten its grip on Hong Kong? Yeah, I, I think it sounds to me, and you know, you have to sort of read between the lines here, but it sounds to me like the extradition bill is gone and it's not coming back. It might be a matter of face saving that they don't want to withdraw it permanently, so they temporarily suspended it. Um, but it's the kind of move where they temporarily suspend it and then let it fade away. It doesn't sound like they have any intention of bringing it back. And the president herself said that it won't come back unless they can appease um, the, the masses in Hong Kong. And that's not going to happen unless it were significantly revised. Is this a face-saving solution for Beijing? How big of a hit did President Xi Jinping himself take from these protests? Uh, that's a great question. I think it does make him a little less stable, but he had very strongly consolidated power as of a year ago, uh, leader for life, uh, and he was in a very strong position, of course, to dig in his heels on the trade war with the United States. Uh, this makes him a little less stable. It's a mistake. It's a blunder. Um, but this doesn't destabilize him to the point that it would affect the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, it, it, it's a mistake. But, uh, you know, he had enough strength and had consolidated power enough that he can make this kind of mistake and still be stable. Matt, and of course, we do have now confirmation that President Xi will meet President Trump at the G20. The Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross making a point this weekend to uh, downplay what could come out of that summit. What are you expecting? Um, I'm expecting nothing to come out of that summit. You know, before the last G20, uh, I was asked the same question on Friday, the day before um, Xi and President Trump had dinner. Uh, and I said, uh, Nothing would come out of it. They would not have an agreement. Um, President Trump might pretend they had an agreement, but he would not have an agreement. Uh, and then on Saturday, they had dinner. And then on Sunday, Trump sent out a tweet saying they had an agreement. Uh, markets uh, rocketed on, on Monday. Uh, and then Tuesday, everyone figured out that uh, Trump had made that up and, and things crashed out for several days. And it was an, an ugly fiasco for markets. Um, it's important to understand that when two leaders get together to talk trade, they usually don't actually talk trade. What they usually do is sign agreements that have that staffers have spent months, if not years, banging out the details of. And if that hasn't happened ahead of time, nothing's really going to happen at the face to face between the leaders. Yeah, I don't think anyone is expecting a grand signing ceremony or anything like that. But uh, surely this still has some symbolic value, at least uh, talking again, right? Oh, yeah, it has symbolic value. And it's one of the reasons why markets in the U.S. are relatively stable right now, because the Trump administration has done a good job um, since the, uh, the market fiasco after the last G20 in early December uh, of sending out positive sounding messages when the actual news is grim. Uh, and the news has been grim all along. It's been particularly grim in the last two months. Um, but they keep sending out these positive messages so markets don't react badly. Uh, and the idea that they're meeting is a positive message. Um, but it, it's not something that's going to lead to any kind of imminent agreement. It might lead to a slight shift here and there in the positions of one or the other. It might even get negotiating teams back together. But these sides are very far apart. Of course, it's been very interesting to hear, though, uh, Bloomberg now hearing that 
the president actually delayed a speech by his vice president on June 4th, which was the anniversary of uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. Now, that could have been a sort of an opening uh, signal to Beijing. But uh, let me just hold a second here, Matt, because I'm getting breaking news on trade, actually, from Japan. Am I, I'm getting that the trade deficit has now come in at 967.1 billion yen. So we're seeing the trade balance now plunging into deficit, not as big as was expected of more than a trillion yen, but still significantly uh, big enough to, Mary had mentioned, 967.1 billion. When it comes to the adjusted numbers, also a deficit of 609.1 billion. When it comes to the exports, you're on your growth uh, contracting 7.8 percent, a much bigger contraction than the previous month of April, not as big as was expected. Imports year on year uh, falling 1.5 percent. Of course, we had some uh, really big dynamics at play, including the Japanese yen strengthening almost 3 percent at the end of May from a month earlier. That was negative for exports, but at the same time, seeing cheaper oil, which may have cut the import bill, which has now contracted 1.5 percent. Matt, let me go back to you. Talk about trade. Of course, we continue to see these trade negotiations between the U.S. and Japan and China, everybody else. Now we're hearing that perhaps there could be a currency clause in the Japan-U.S. negotiations. President Trump again coming out and attacking Europe and China over what he considers is intentional weakening of their currencies. Is there a risk here that this trade war could evolve into a currency war? I don't think so. Um, Trump is is shoveling a lot of rhetoric here, but the Treasury Department is not backing him up, uh, nor are the numbers that anybody else is seeing. I mean, the reality is is that currencies are always moving, uh, and currencies are devaluing in China and in Europe. But the real question is, are the governments deliberately manipulating the currencies uh, downward? And there's no indication of them doing that. There are reasons why currencies are going downward, uh, legitimate economic reasons why these currencies are moving downward. It's not about gaining trade advantage. So President Trump likes to get some mileage out of that, but no one, not even his own Treasury Department, seems to think that either government is driving the currency down to gain trade advantage. And that's what matters uh, in, in trade talks and trade relationships.